call to order this meeting of the Washington County Board of Education. We do have a quorum this evening. We have six members present and our student mem member. At this time, we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence, and Mrs. Murray will be leading us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. have approval of tonight's agenda move for approval thank you mr. Bickford is there a second second thank you mr. Stauffer any discussion none motion is on approval of this evening's agenda all those in favor Aye. okay we're unanimous and the student member concurs we'll move on to approval of the minutes madam president I move to approve of the approval of the closed session minutes dated Tuesday, June 18th, 2019. Thank you, Mr. Gesford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Any corrections or additions to that set of minutes? No? Okay, all those in favor of approval of the closed session minutes dated June 18th? Okay, we have four affirmative votes. Any opposed? Abstentions? Two abstentions. Motion carries. Madam President, I also move uh, for the approval of the business meeting minutes dated Tuesday, June 18th, 2019. Thank you, Mr. Gessford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Any additions or corrections to the business meeting minutes for June 18th? All those in favor? Okay, four affirmative votes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, two abstentions. Minutes stand approved as presented. Uh, next, we have public comment. I've heard it. No, no, Chris. No. Student I member concerned. Student oh, member concerned. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. First. Thank you. Public comment. We have no one signed up this evening in advance. Is there anyone out there who would like to come forward? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'd like to read to you from a policy that we have regarding public comment, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from policy KD regarding procedures at business meetings. Each person wishing to address the Board of Education is encouraged but not required to sign up prior to the meeting and may address any topic concerning Washington County Public Schools except personnel or student matters which clearly identify an individual or individuals. Each speaker may speak, up, may speak for up to five minutes. So Mr. Bickford is our timekeeper and he'll let you know if you get close to the five minutes. Just wave frantically. <laughs> okay, would you introduce yourself, please? My name is Chris Detro. So in other words, just speak in generalities. Um, just don't name okay. students or personnel. Okay. okay? Um, my son was attacked at a public school in a classroom, as most of you probably have already known, you've seen the article. And I'm just super concerned at the response from Washington County Public Schools, especially as almost referring to it as a fight. My son is a special education student and he was attacked. This is on video. I have the video if any of you would like to watch it. Um, it was brutal. And when I met with the school and I met with Board of Ed officials, they refused to even watch this video. It was very disturbing to me as a mom. Um, also, I was not told the truth about what happened had I not seen this video, which was shared on social media. I would never have known my son was attacked and probably needed medical attention. 
My point is, you guys are t gonna reduce the amount of adults, support staff in the classrooms. I have a real problem with this. Already, teachers need more eyes and ears in the classrooms, and I don't see how you guys think that that is acceptable. Our kids aren't safe at school, and I just wanted to make my voice heard and speak for my son. Board member response to public comment. Our next uh, item on the agenda is old business. We have consideration of the second reading of proposed changes to policy JICJ, uses of personally owned electronic devices. Good evening, Mr. Trotta. Good evening. On June 28th, on June 18th, the Board of Education approved the first reading of the proposed changes to policy JICJ. There was an opportunity for public comment. No comments were received. The policy committee did offer minor modifications to Article 4, subsection B, to clarify certain provisions of the policy. The proposed changes to this policy were shared with school administrators, and they are supportive of the proposed changes because the modifications provide clear direction as to what is permissible with regard to electronic devices. If the proposed changes are adopted, the policy committee has requested that administrators monitor this policy during the upcoming school year and provide a report at the end of this new school year uh, as to whether there is a need for any modifications to the policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotter. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the second reading of proposed changes to policy JICJ entitled Use of Personally Owned Electronic Devices. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Any discussion or any questions? Yes, I have some questions. Um, I have some concerns about this policy because I hear um, in schools right now that we have a huge problem with <clears throat> cell phones and teachers having no control over students. I'd like to know how we're going to enforce this, this policy, um, and finding out recently that school by school, everyone does their own thing. Maybe the principal has a policy that this is what he's going to do in, in his school or her school. And then we have a teacher that says they don't really care as long as the instruction is getting completed. This policy seems to be a little bit more defined that from the time that they get off of the school bus, um, they're not allowed to, until um, during instruction time. So that would be during the um, periods in between periods of class um, and also during lunch. But in the classroom, how do we pull that back in and tell the students that you cannot do this any longer? And then once we tell them once, and then they turn around and do it again in that same period, what is ramifications going to be? Uh, I can speak uh, to you know, the secondary level, and I assume it's not a whole lot different than elementary, but I don't think it's a big issue in elementary school. Uh, but it really, you know, there's been a little bit, you know, there has been some inconsistency that has led to some real difficulty um, with controlling whether or not students are using their phones during instructional time. I think we had some kind of mixed messages over the last few years, which I think has been cleared up uh, really just, you know, through uh, some communications from the superintendent to principals. And now this policy is really going to lend uh, a lot of uh, help to schools in, in, in being very consistent about the use of cell phones during instructional time. Um, that there's a policy to support the actions that are taken. And, and really, it would be just like any other disciplinary matter uh, where, you know, a student is typically, you know, if they're being disruptive or talking while the teacher is instructing the class, you know, there's usually a warning, uh, um, proximity control, different things that teachers use. And at some point, 
if it reaches that level according to the teacher's judgment uh, that, a, that a discipline referral is warranted, then the teacher would write a discipline referral. And then at that point, the administrators will take over with you know communications home to the parent, parent conferences, uh, providing consequences, all the things that happen really for any violation of a, of a rule that occurs in class. Uh, and everybody, the teacher, knowing that they're going to be supported that way by the administration, uh, and, and really students having you know, clear guidance uh, on what the expectations are regarding the use of cell phones. Um, the policy is going to be a tremendous help in that way um, that, to just sort of create some consistency. It also takes away from, uh, to address the other part of your question, um, the uh, latitude that teachers have had to say, well, based on the activity we're doing right now, go ahead and you can, as long as you keep your earbuds in and, it, and the sound down to where no one else can hear it, go ahead and be on your cell phone, listen to music, do whatever, takes that latitude away uh, that, you know, you don't have that option. Um, and so that in the past has created a problem when a school decided we don't allow it during instructional time, but one teacher did or two teachers did, and then this, it creates a problem, that inconsistency where students don't understand why I'm allowed to do it in one class and not in another. Uh, so it sort of eliminates that. So all of that is going to help schools be consistent uh, and for teachers to know they're going to be supported when they tell students, you know, you can't have that cell phone out, you need to put it away. And if the student doesn't comply, they know what steps to take at that point. Okay. So how are we going to be notifying the parents then and, you know, the, I guess, the, the citizens at large? How are we going to start that process? <laughs> Well, that, that occurs, like again, like any other disciplinary uh, thing that's being handled, any disciplinary matter that's handled in the classroom. Uh, very typically, you know, for example, um, if a teacher tells, sees a student has one out and says, you need to put that away, you know it's against school rules, and, and student puts it away, next day tries the same thing. At some point, that teacher may just decide to call the parent and say, Listen, you know, twice this week, you know, Billy has tried to uh, use his cell phone during class. I don't want to have to write him a referral, but if it happens again, I'm going to. So please talk to your child. The same way we would if they were just being disruptive. Uh, but at some point when that teacher decides this is persistent enough or serious enough, I'm writing a referral, then at that point, uh, the student would be pulled into the office uh, by the assistant principal typically. Uh, and would be given some consequence and the parents would be informed of that um, and you know that consequence can run the full gamut of, of what's reasonable according to our disciplinary matrix um, you know so it could simply be uh, a detention uh, in school suspension if it if it is persistent uh, as, as a consequence maybe Further, Mr. Gasford, you might be asking how we're going to communicate to the public the, the change, but some schools have already had this already as a standard and they've communicated that well. I think part of the reason we're asking for the second read this evening, this would make it into our student handbook. Student handbook is distributed to every family in the county, so we'd have that in writing in our student handbook. It wouldn't be after the fact, after the publication is <coughs> completed. Uh, most schools have some type of back to school night. Like particularly for freshmen or incoming sixth graders or uh, PTA night or whatever so we'd anticipate that the schools would communicate it that way school newsletters it probably would be a highlight in school school newsletters uh, teachers obviously are going to be sharing this information so I think there are a variety of venues that way uh, we'll also follow up with Aaron Anderson to see if there's something appropriate as far as uh, media release put it on our Facebook page uh, there's we have some other people who do a lot of communication for us so they might uh, help us communicate this as well. And, and I, I, I would uh, like to add some additional information. The policy committee requested that there be a communication plan, so they, they were aware of the need to um, let the community know about this, this change in the policy because, as Dr. Akers noted, this is significant because the policy is real clear. 
no use of electronic devices during instructional time. It's that simple. And um, so there is, if the board approves the policy, we would be issuing a press release. Uh, it will go into the student handbook. Uh, we receive, we send communications out to our school principals and our school administrators will follow up with all the principals to, to review with them the policy if the board adopts it this evening so that when they have their, their opening, when they open school and meet with parents, they can, this is something that can be stressed with parents. This is a new policy. When will this be reviewed again then? The, the, the policy <coughs> committee uh, thought it would be helpful to see how this policy works during the upcoming new school year. And then with Dr. Palmer here and Dr. Akers, they'll follow up with all the school principals to have them monitor this policy during the new school year to see whether it's, it's effective, whether there needs to be some adjustments. So the policy committee has asked for an annual review and, and uh, we're well aware, aware of that uh, recommendation and staff is gonna follow up on that and report back to the superintendent and the board at the end of the, um, the new school year. Secondary, I mean, we, we've heard from secondary, so elementary. Have, have we had any incidents concerning, you know, parents wanting to make sure that their their child has a cell phone? I mean, I know my grandkids, they have cell phones, and their parents don't allow them to go, but we know that that's not gonna happen with all families. You know, have we had incidents with concerns with cell phones in elementary? We certainly have students that have cell phones and have had them out in classrooms and it's a matter of same, same um, for secondary, but certainly not to the level we see in secondary. Um, and it's a matter of saying put your cell phone away. Um, I don't see it as big of a concern. Certainly we have elementary students that that is their lifeline, um, especially for some of our students that are in transition that they don't want to give it up. So it's um, just a matter of ensuring during instructional time that it's put away. It's in your pocket, it's in your book bag, it's out of, it's not being used. It's for the most part our elementary students, it's, it's really not a, it's not a big of a concern as we see at the secondary level with some of those students. Right, right. Well, I'm going to support this policy. Um, I, I really, I'm glad that we're going to be reviewing it within a year. I hope that we really support the teachers and making sure that we give them some bite on this and that it goes all the way up, you know, to our principals that they support that because I think in the past some conversation I've had was I don't have any support. I don't have anything. It's just some teachers do, some teachers don't, and then. The, I'm the bad person. And I don't want one teacher feeling that they're the bad person. So I hope that we will continue to um, enforce this across the board. Um, and I do uh, look forward to the yearly review to see where we are and how it's worked. Yeah, Mr. Um, so I'm generally pleased with the outcome we reached on this policy. Um, and being in schools every day, I can see the huge distraction that cell phones can be on students' education. Um, I'm even guilty of guilty myself of it sometimes. Um, but that distraction, from what I've seen, is different from class to class. Some teachers say no cell phones, and they enforce it, and that works. Um, while other teachers may just not really enforce it, and it becomes more of a distraction than other classes. Um, so I think that this policy will help, um, as they all explain, this will help make it more consistent um, class to class if it's implemented the right way um, and I'm also glad that it maintains um, flexibility of students to use cell phones during non-instructional time that was something I felt pretty strongly you know we're all used to using our cell phones during lunch between classes before school on the bus um, and the changes that we made in this policy will um, not impact that so that it'll keep that flexibility for students so I'm going to support this with my opinion vote okay. anyone else no further discussion, then we'll move to the vote. The motion is to approve the second reading of proposed changes to policy JICJ entitled use of personally owned electronic devices. All those in favor? 
right, we have six affirmative votes and the student member concurs, so motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, our next item for consideration is tonight's consent agenda. And we have Mr. Prue standing in for Mr. Bakewell, our supervisor. Good evening, Mrs. Williams, board members, Dr. Michael. The Procurement Review Committee has uh, four solicitations uh, in front of you this evening for your review and approval. And I'm here, to, and staff is here to see if you have any questions. Thank you. Is there a motion? I move to approve the awards, renewals, and procurements for professional design services for new Washington County Technical High School programs to Nolker and Hall Incorporated at a cost of $82,470. Produce to Reinhardt Orchards Inc. and Keeney Produce and Gourmet at the unit prices listed. Zonar GPS system software renewal to Zonar system at a cost of $67,862.52. And Adobe Suite licenses renewal to Digital Information Services at a cost of $55,534.50. Any discussion or any questions for Mr. Prue? Mr. Prue, I have a question, and it's regarding the professional design services for uh, the new Tech High programs. And my question is, have we used the services of, is it Nolker and Hall Inc.? Have we used these services in the past? And if so, with satisfaction? We have considerably. Uh, as you may uh, be aware, one of the architects of the firm is Bob Asbury. He's done several uh, jobs for us. Uh, his firm, which was an independent, was absorbed with Nolker and Hull uh, a year or two ago. They actually have done some recent designs for us on some of our vestibule projects. No issues or concerns with, with their services. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move to the vote. Uh, the motion is on Mr. Bickford's motion as read. All those in favor? Affirmative votes and the student member concurs. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the superintendent's report. Dr. Michael. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Uh, board members tonight, I'm pleased to invite Dr. Hanks and, and Dr. Henson to the table. Uh, as the board's aware, we've been kind of having an all-out effort on helping our children uh, particularly be able to read, but uh, really a whole literacy component to what we're trying to help our children with, reading, speaking, listening, uh, writing, communicating, those types of things. And uh, a great deal of work has gone into this over the last couple of years. I certainly want to credit Dr. Hanks, Dr. Pugh, and the team that have been working on this. We really feel like we have a comprehensive plan with our expansion of pre-K. We're adding to that comprehensive plan. We're trying to make up for lost time in middle school and high school with a variety of interventions and expansion of our curriculum and resources and tools to teachers. Um, and even before the team begins, and on top of thanking them, I want to thank the board. Uh, we've come forward with a number of um, not directly budgeted initiatives, some purchase of some library collections or some classroom collections and, and items, and the board has been very supportive of that. And that has, I've heard great things from teachers. Right, the other thing I want to mention, I was at a uh, reading workshop last week. How many people were there, Dr. Hanks? About 250. More than 200, close to 250 people there in one room. And the energy in the room, and when they broke out into groups, uh, very, very positive. Today I was at a math, uh, science, elementary uh, conference, had about 150 people there. They're there all week. Again, very positive energy. I just appreciate the efforts of our staff, their teachers that are working so hard uh, to help our students. And I think there's going to be great things that come out of that that will affect the lives of children forever. And I, I truly believe that out of this work. So, Dr. Hanks. Thank you very much. Good evening, board and Dr. Michael. Um, we are thrilled to present what I would term a bird's eye view. There's a lot of detail into what we are doing day to day. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions if it's not uh, fully clear, but it really is just a summary of our efforts. And so, um, as you know, for us to be able to receive the Striving Readers uh, grant, uh, we had to have a comprehensive literacy plan. That plan is about 300 pages. So I won't burden you with all of that detail today, 
but know that it was organized into five what the state, we modeled after the state's goal and the federal um, request, was to have um, separated into five keys, and that's the keys to literacy. And one is instructional leadership and what we were going to do about, you know, making sure that our instructional leaders were prepared to lead buildings and lead the efforts in literacy. Key two, strategic professional development. Key three is continuity of standards-based instruction. Key four is a comprehensive system of assessments. And key five is tiered instruction. Each of those keys is divided up into levels. What are we doing for birth through five? What are we doing kindergarten through grade five? grades 6 through 8 and 9 through 12, so that there isn't an area that we haven't uncovered or created a plan for. So in those efforts, we had two priorities uh, through all of this, and this is going to overlap in several of the keys. That is to nurture the talent of the teachers. We have some incredibly talented teachers, and so through our strategic um, professional development, we are trying to build teacher capacity to address the needs of all students that walk into their classrooms. We're doing that through um, professional development and evidence-based strategies. Everything that we're doing is backed by research and evidence, um, and also our communities of practice. And that was a bit of a change for us, where most of the professional development occurs during the summer, when teachers are, have a clear mind and are not running to a classroom the next day, where they can process their learning and then throughout the year, we've been offering the communities of practice. And that's time for teachers to come back together to talk about what works well, celebrate their successes, but then to also um, look, deal with the challenges. And every teacher comes with a different set of challenges. They help each other, but we are also uh, surround them with content experts that can also help to create plans, adjust plans, and move forward. And those have been happening quarterly. The next priority was to really look at customizing the learning for our students. And meeting the needs of individual students. Those needs can't be categorized into similarities anymore. Their students can come. If you have 25 students in your classroom, you have 25 different needs. And how do we address those? Um, and that really has been a work of collaboration much further than just our office. That's through, obviously, early learning, our gifted and talented education, through our world languages and English learners, our special education, and our Title I office. We've collaborated to be able to provide the right supports for all students. It's also through action planning that I'll explain in a little bit to you of what that looks like and customized learning plans for students. And I'll give you a little more information as to that as well. So in addition, we've also worked on aligning our resources. So as we are engaging teachers in professional development and creating action plans, we recognize that we need to be able to align our resources to our practice. So as Dr. Michael said, we want to uh, thank you for supporting many of these efforts that we've come to you and request. Uh, the grant allowed us to purchase pre-K home libraries, which we will continue to do again this summer. Research shows us that students who have at least 50 books in their home uh, prior to coming to school are more likely to achieve grade level status by third grade. So we bought 50 books for every child enrolled in our pre-K program last summer. They were delivered, most of them delivered by the pre-K teacher or given to the students when they came to the classroom uh, the first night. We also invested in classroom libraries to build the teacher's libraries. We heard throughout this process that teachers are spending a lot of time trying to find the books that align to our curriculum and what they were trying to teach. So we had a band of about 100 teachers come together to select the books that align to the curriculum and purchase those for every teacher, over 100 books that are aligned instructionally. We also invested in high-low readers. That's high-low stands for high interest and low lexile. That is across the board, but mostly in our secondary buildings. And that is because many of our striving readers are students that are um, not quite reaching grade level expectations or in some cases significantly behind. They usually drop off in independent reading. They don't want to read and they usually enact many strategies to avoid reading at all costs. And so our effort there was to make sure that we could put just right books in their hands, books they could read, and books they wanted to read. And our goal started out uh, with just read one book. Uh, we had examples of students that hadn't read a full book since fourth grade and they were in high school. Um, and again, oftentimes they do a great job even looking like they're reading. And so the high interest, low, like uh, the high interest, low lexile books um, 
did just that. We were able to provide libraries to all our intervention teachers um, who were involved in action planning and have expanded that even to our special educators and to several of our classrooms um, that have students to select books. We also celebrate and thank you for the guided reading book rooms that were delivered at the end of this school year that teachers are already thoroughly excited about. Um, this again allows them to provide guided reading opportunities, which means selecting books at exactly the instructional level for students without having to hunt them down. In many cases, these book rooms, um, some schools had them, but they were years and years old, so you'd pull expecting a set of six and there would only be three and you'd be running around the building trying to find the other two. So this was a way to update the collection and we did it with authentic texts. So they aren't the boring type of books that we sometimes see in schools or the black and white printed out copies from online. These are books that we're very familiar with, um, Chicka Chicka Boom Boom, Well Loved Stories, six copies of each, also aligned to the standards in the curriculum for teachers. Uh, the action planning that I referred to for customized learning means that we engage in a process at schools where we take a look at the assessments that our students are taking, what information does that provide to us, we look at both quantitative information, that's our ERI, Lexile scores, our park data, any data that's available to us, but also qualitative, the information coming in from the schools um, and the teachers themselves. We analyze that information to look for trends and pattern, patterns across students, across grade levels, across content, to look for strengths and weaknesses so that we can design an action plan that targets the exact areas that students need. We develop that action plan and monitor progress regularly. Monitoring that progress allows us then to move into adjustments. If what we planned isn't working, we quickly adjust. We no longer, the traditional format was to act and assess. We teach all year, we assess and find out if it worked. This is a cyclical process where we first look at the assessments, what do they give us, what can they tell us, and then continue that cycle as needed. And so, Again, bringing it back to the bird's eye view, when we talk about how we're addressing literacy for all students, that really is through the school improvement planning process, where schools determine themselves what the focus is of their school, what their needs are based on their data, and create a plan for all students, um, and what strategies will be used and how they'll monitor that progress. But we know there are subgroups of students where what we're doing for all isn't enough, and we need to add additional supports and layered in. That's our literacy action planning and that's targeted supports for subgroups of students. Beyond that, there are still students in our schools who need more intensive intervention and more individualized support, and that's where we go into customized learning plans. Those are same process of action planning, but designed for an individual student. We look very closely at that individual student. In doing that, there's, you have this as a separate handout. Um, this is not meant to overwhelm you with the detail inside, but more to see the process at hand. The big square on the left that says tier one is what excellent in initial instruction is for all students. This is the literacy, balanced literacy. It's what we have focused a lot of our professional development on for teachers of what literacy instruction looks like for all students. We wanna make sure that all students have access to that tier one instruction and that intervention supports or other services are not provided during that time. That's critical because we don't want students pulled from that instruction. In addition, we have tier 2A. I say in addition because it does not replace that first box. But there are some students who to succeed in that first tier one need additional supports. This might mean that we give them a graphic organizer when we're handing them a text or we support them with um, reading if necessary, a shared reading type experience. So what kind of accommodations do we need to provide in the classroom by the general educator that helps them access that instruction? In addition, if that is not enough, tier 2B is where we offer um, a more targeted approach we can level. So that's if a student's not reading at grade level, we'll provide text to them at their instructional level and we'll provide that small group instruction specific to their needs. That would be considered tier 2B and it is an intervention. However, some students have gaps in their learning even beyond that that needs targeted instruction. We call that tier three, and that is where we are explicitly teaching skills that are missing for the student. That is in addition to the other pieces of the puzzle. And so this is just a visual for school teams and teachers um, as we're planning to make sure that we, when we're discussing customized learning for students, that all four of those things are discussed and that students have all of them, not some of them. 
And that brings us to a little bit more focused at the levels and what we're doing at each level. So you see the quote in front of you, which says, powerful early intervention can change the path of a child's journey to literacy. And I think that anyone can walk into a pre-K classroom and see the learning that's very visible um, through play, through instruction, through many opportunities we see our children grow. There's um, several years ago there was an NPR audio clip that showed a correlation between the cries of babies and the home language of the parent because of the intonation. So really the, the conclusion of that study was that children learn these literacy skills truly from birth on. So we uh, understand the power in embracing that philosophy and offering this opportunity to um, as many children as we can in Washington County. So for that, I need to thank you and Dr. Michael for being support, supportive of the pre-K expansion that's taken place. We have really hit the ground running this summer. Last year, we had, um, with every seat full, the capacity to serve 945 students full day. This year, thanks to the expansion, we have the opportunity to offer these types of learning and literacy opportunities to 1,300. As of today, I wrote it down, we are at, we have sent home 957 enrollment packets um, for students in Washington County. Last year at this time, we were at 615. So we have already um, increased 350 beyond where we were last year. So we're gonna continue to reach out to families. Um, my administrative assistant and I were just at a meal machine yesterday trying to hand out packets to little kiddos and their families that might be taking part of that program too. And we plan to visit more of those locations, the library, other places where we can find families that, that may be in need of this but really not have received any of the communication that we've already sent out. Um, the, we're gonna continue with the advanced learner program. Last year we saw a lot of success in two of our classrooms there. At Funkstown, again, that advanced learner program will continue at Funkstown Elementary School. One of the great data points from that is, um, of course, all of those children exited that program reading at grade level, but truthfully, the lowest one was reading at a beginning first grade level, and the top one was reading at a beginning second grade level. So coming out of pre-K and watching that, even with play-based, developmentally appropriate instruction, it, they were just placed in an environment where their learning was just propelled um, immensely. So we have kiddos that are um, starting kindergarten reading at the second grade level thanks to that program. So we have seen great success there and, and know that we'll continue to see great success there as well. As far as learning outcomes, there was just a study released this week, I'm not sure if you saw it through the state of Georgia. Um, they're in their 27th year of statewide universal pre-K. So it's a program that we continually look at to see both their successes and their challenges. One of their challenges is a national challenge in that when we create these universal pre-K programs, um, we, we get the momentum going and then it seems to slow down by third grade. So what we know and what we've learned and what the state of Georgia is also saying is we need to make sure that we are increasing the rigor then at, at kindergarten and first grade and second grade because what we don't want to do is have these children leaving reading at a first grade or second grade level and then they just become stagnant. So um, between collaborations with many of our content specialists, we're ensuring that that's not occurring here in Washington County with the expansion efforts that we've had in place. Just this week, I was also at the math professional development and um, the module one math typically for kindergarten was to work with counting and cardinality be between one to 10. And they've already increased up to 20 because what they're seeing is so many of our pre-K students that participated are well beyond that standard. And so what we don't wanna do is revert that learning and instead increase it. So we're gonna to continue to do that. We, we do that very naturally in reading and meet children where they are and continue that growth. And with the additional resources that have been put in place, I think we'll see great things come out of that. As far as future impact, obviously we hope to see our kindergarten readiness increase. Um, we're giving more opportunities for our teachers to address those social and emotional concerns through play and um, obviously more time to be social with one another. And um, the other thing too that I wanted to speak to just with the future impact, one of the qualities that came out of the Georgia study was also that it's not just a matter of increasing pre-K expansion, but making sure it's high quality. So what we have done with our pre-K classrooms is um, put them through the statewide accreditation process so that we are ensuring that it's not just a matter of we're gonna add more seats, but we wanna make sure these are high quality seats. So right now um, in our school system, we have 16 schools 
that are at that high level five accreditation, which is the highest level of quality in a pre-K program. We have one that we're waiting a, deci a decision for because the state only makes those decisions quarterly. So we've had one that have already gone through the accreditation process. We're just waiting to hear back. Then the remaining nine schools will go through the process next year. We are not required to put our um, pre-K programs through accreditation, but we are for those that are funded through the grant. We have six schools that are grant funded. What we didn't want to do for our families is say, these six schools are at a very high level, but the remaining are not participating at all. We wanted to make sure there was consistency, and we also wanted to ensure high quality. So we made the decision as an early learning department to go through. It's a, it's a rigorous process, but it's well worth it. So by the end of the school year next year, all of our schools um, that have pre-K programs in, which, is, which are all of the elementary schools except for Eastern, uh, will be at that high level five of, of, of performance. The other thing that's going to help propel our programs are some of the diagnostic tools that Laura and her team have put in place that she's going to speak to next that are really well research based tools that we can use to also further instruction in our pre-K programs. So I get to speak to um, what addresses key four in our comprehensive plan, and that is the comprehensive system of assessments. Um, when I speak to early learning assessments, I want to make sure to clarify that none of these tests are sit down pencil paper for our little learners. So I don't want to um, get that impression at all uh, portrayed. However, in pre-K, we did realize we've been doing the early learning assessment for quite some time, but there were some missing pieces to that assessment that was not giving us the information we needed to design instruction for all students, um, that being mostly oral language. And that is uh, students' ability to hear sounds, to recognize phonemic awareness, and that sound, uh, something can represent something else. My IGDES is an assessment that we're going to be giving to all pre-K students in the fall as a universal screener. Um, it stands for Individual Growth and Development Indicators. Now this assessment, again, it's often what many teachers do. Um, how many letters and sounds do you have? If I say this word, can you come up with a rhyme for it? So it doesn't, to the students, they're not going to know that they're being assessed, but the teacher's able to collect information using an iPad really quickly. But what it will allow us to do is to see any children that would be categorized as at risk, meaning that developmentally where they are, they may be having some gaps already in their learning. In addition, we're going to continue with our concepts of print. It's a very simple assessment where students tell you the front of the book, the back of the book. Can they tell the difference between the pictures and the words? It lets us know how much exposure that they've had to early literacy. Um, in kindergarten, we're going to be reintroducing Dibbles. Dibbles was very popular 15 to 20 years ago. It's still highly research-based. All of these are. It stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy. And it's a quick assessment. Again, many of our teachers have been using components of this or different variations of this. This gives us consistency across the district. It also gives us a way to collect it district-wide um, to be able to say, where are our students that are at risk? The goal being that not a single child will be able to slip uh, by us without us being able to address specific needs at a time when we can address them quickly um, and target it. We continue to give con concepts of print in kindergarten. Uh, that assessment, the rigors change with the age of the child. Um, by the time they're in kindergarten, towards the end of kindergarten, we're looking for them to be able to tell the difference between words and letters, spaces between their words, but even to be able to recognize letters, a capital M versus a lowercase m. And that also lets us know are they on the path for literacy. In first grade, we'll continue, of course, to give the reading inventory. That will allow us, as a universal screener for us, to be able to say who's not reading at the expected level um, and what questions do we need to ask further about that. For students who are at risk in first grade, we can continue to give that Dibbles assessment. That will give us very specific areas to focus on for those students. Um, for an example, it will tell us if a child's not rhyming. And that's significant because it means they're not seeing word parts. And that's what we're looking for, that type of uh, specificity. We also um, give the COGAT in first grade. And that, um, while it's used for us to be able to identify giftedness in children or areas of giftedness, the information that that assessment provides is much beyond just the gifted program and that we can pull information from that as well to learn more about our students. So we don't want to ignore that information as well as we're creating our action plans for our schools. 
So this slide just tells you what each of those stands for. Again, my IGDs is Individual Growth and Development Indicators. That assessment is about 25 years old. Dibbles goes back as well, about that same amount of time. And um, COGAT is Cognitive Aptitude Test. In addition, key five in our comprehensive literacy plan is tiered instruction and intervention. And basically that means now that we have the information on our students, what are we doing about it? And we need a very targeted approach, especially at the early grades. In pre-K, if a student comes up as at risk, we have a systematic response, a program called Stepping Stones. You may see it, it's the same program that we use in our Super Readers program that our community volunteers have been doing. It really is founded in rhyming and introducing students to nursery rhymes and to animal sounds, much of what many students have early on um, at home. It's 25 lessons that will give that to students and uh, quick in and out at four makes a huge difference. That's available as well at kindergarten. Should a student in kindergarten need more than stepping stones, it moves right into sound partners. These, this um, picks up where stepping stones left off but gets a little bit more heavy into the phonics and um, blending and includes writing. Uh, sound partners is considered intensive. Both of these are rated number two beyond reading recovery, which is a one-on-one -on -one intervention. This is the second highest effect size for early intervention. Um, so uh, an obvious choice for us. Should a student, after having that type of intervention, still need more intensive supports, this is when we would move into the scripted systematic program of foundations to make sure that we are explicitly giving them those early foundational skills beginning early. That can take us through to first grade. We add leveled literacy intervention at first grade, which uh, addresses comprehension needs, so students may be starting to read, but they're not able to tell you what they read. And this helps them to build those comprehension strategies as they're reading. In second grade, uh, students who are reading, sometimes you'll find them reading choppy, one word at a time, it will sound laborious for them. Um, I sometimes refer to it as reading like you're chopping cucumbers and we want to make it nice and smooth. We introduce read naturally. Oftentimes when we've intervened with phonics for students, that's one of the side effects. And so we need to clean up that fluency a little bit and get them comfortable with reading. Our goal is to do that all up to second grade so that we're sending students to third grade reading at grade level with comprehension. We do get more intensive as we need to as the grades go on. At this point, it would allow us to provide students who are still demonstrating a need for more intensive intervention, still struggling to maintain grade level, we would go to the intensity of a Wilson program. Wilson requires about three years to intervene. So we're talking about basically our more disabled, reading disabled child. This would allow us to, by the end of elementary, get students to grade level. That's the ideal situation. When those don't work out as planned, we still have our customized learning plan for students individually if we need to dip in and out of several of these interventions. The assessment allows us to do that. So the next piece to this one is putting those two pieces together. You have this document as well. This is what we're calling our 2019-2020 Early Literacy Initiative. And that's basically because it's not in every school yet. These assessments are coming in the fall. Again, not really new assessments to teachers. They'll be very familiar to the tools teachers already use. It's just a new tool to collect that information. But the celebration here is that the state of Maryland passed COMAR, I believe it was in June, could have been end of May, June, 13A0609, which is requiring a plan like this of all school districts by September 2020. This means that we have it in place one year in advance of that requirement, and that would be August 2019. How did we come up with this plan? I wanted to give a little bit of a background. Um, we applied for the Maryland Early Literacy Grant and very similar to Striving Readers and very similar to what we see coming out from Kerwin Commission, they were all asking the same thing. Do you have a plan? What assessments are you uni using? Universal assessments to determine student needs and do you have a systematic response when students show that they're at risk? So we applied for the Maryland Early Literacy Grant, which was written in much the same wording. Um, we targeted Hickory Elementary School. The reason is their Title I status, but also their size. Small, small enough for us to have an impact and be able to determine effectiveness quickly. 
Uh, we provided the universal screener to all of their pre-K and kindergarten students uh, using MyAGDs at pre-K and Dibbles at kindergarten. You see the list there of what those assessments tell us, oral language, rhyming, and alliteration, phonemic awareness, and phonics. And we trained, um, we had two assistants that were hired through this grant and trained them in stepping stones and sound partners. And that was their job. They knew how to assess, they knew how to progress monitor, and they knew how to provide the intervention. And the results, and I'm gonna kind of focus you on the date up there, only five districts in the state received this grant. And we were the only district to start it this early. The reason being we wanted to be able to adjust for the 2019-20 school year, and we had time when you're four, a month is a long time. And so we began the intervention on April 23rd, and this goes to May 31st was when we collected the next round of data. You can see that we were able to make growth. Um, I, You'll see first grade added in there because their school is so small. We had extra time in the assistance schedule and we requested an addendum to the grant to include first grade. And so we used the Dibbles in first grade and we targeted seven students there that were showing signs of at risk at this time of the year. You can see the data there of the growth students made in at least one or more categories. For Hickory, we noticed many of our pre-K students were struggling with um, rhyming. And so they did some heavy intervention. Stepping Stones is very much with the nursery rhymes targeting rhyming so it was exciting to see the growth over time when you see nine out of 15 i will tell you one of the things we learned is that some of our el students might need something a little more and different so we brought in our el uh, team to help us design a plan next year to address we that as well english learners. english learners yes which we have at hickory for as small as school as it is i think they had like 38 el students I mean, it's a substantial uh, portion of their population, like 10% of their population. Yes. And we know we uh, engage in lots of conversations with our English learners office and experts that immersing them in the language is most important. So we didn't want to do a pull out type of a program, but maybe something that allows them to socialize and interact and speak. They usually remain very quiet uh, when they don't understand the language. So next steps in our early literacy initi initiative was to spread it beyond Hickory using our grant to the Kerwin Commission. This has allowed us to um, train, hire, train 10 regional paraprofessionals. And why I say paraprofessionals rather than teachers is because what we're looking for is to close gaps that they would have received prior to coming to school. The same skills we ask parents to teach. We need the training for stepping stones and sound partners is considered for a tutor and does not require a teacher um, to do this so it's very cost effective but these paraprofessionals are going to be highly trained paraprofessionals in the assessments and the intervention only so we're not asking them to do the lunch duty and that we want them to get their hands on as many students as possible and so we've coordinated them into school teams where we have large elementary schools that may have multiple kindergarten classrooms they'll be able to help the teachers to assess our students early in the year, especially as teachers are just getting to know these assessments and these tools. They'll be able to move to regional schools to help with those assessments, and then move right into the intervention, um, which we will create through those action plannings, which students, which interventions. So they'll be able to start right away on the stepping stones and sound partners. So I don't want to ignore our secondary efforts as well and what we're doing in secondary. So much like what we did with Hickory, we had a pilot program using the Striving Readers Grant at South Hagerstown High School where we identified ninth grade students for a program called Reading Apprenticeship. Reading Apprenticeship is not explicit teaching of, um, of skills, it's about teaching them how to be readers, how to know themselves as readers and what strategies to use in their reading. It engages them in a lot of reading. Um, it makes the reading process visible to them. They talk out loud about what's happening as they're reading. They gain insight into their own reading process. But the most important there is they develop a repertoire of problem solving strategies for over overcoming obstacles in their reading. These students at secondary are often, when they come across something that's difficult, they're quick to abandon a book. And so teaching them those problem solving skills is essential. This is also a research based. Um, program. The beauty in this one is it's not just intervention that is trained. The teachers at South High are our district literacy lead teachers. An intervention teacher was trained. 
a social studies teacher, an English teacher, and a science teacher. Those students have those four teachers on their schedule. They don't travel together, but their schedule keeps those teachers there, so there's consistency. I'm gonna teach you a strategy to use, the social studies teachers using that strategy in their classroom. And these were the results. We had 87% gains in those students in their reading levels and lexiles moving up. So our next step for reading apprenticeship, and again, this is more of a comprehensive intervention for students where it's not a pull-out program alone. It is a all day they're, we're addressing their needs in literacy. We're looking at Williamsport High School who has a large English learner population as well. There is specific training just for EL and our teachers there will be attending that. We are also um, spreading to North Hagerstown High School's Freshman Academy. E. Russell Picks Middle School, we're going to be doing eighth grade there. They feed into South High and they've been working with those South High teachers um, in the spring to prepare for that. Also Western Heights, Springfield Middle School, and South Hagerstown High School's grade 10 asked to expand because those students will be moving to grade 10. So the 10th grade teachers are also learning um, training. One of the things uh, that happened throughout this pilot is when we know something works, more teachers want in on it and want to learn more about it. So we did hold a spring book study that um, garnered 23 participants. This summer, MSDE is offering the training, and because of our high numbers here, they offered it right here in this room uh, last week. And we had 52 um, over the course of summer. There are trainings throughout the summer. It's a three-day training uh, in the summer, and then two follow-ups in the fall. 52 of our teachers will be trained in the reading apprenticeship. And so we are hoping that all of these efforts are going to yield great results for our students, but most importantly, to make them literate students. I'm sure the team will be glad to answer any questions, but I, I, I know it was a lengthy presentation. Appreciate the bird's eye view. It might have been, more bird, might have been a little closer bird's eye view than you anticipated. We, we do have a comprehensive strategy of what we're trying to do to help our children. Again, I think it's going to affect their lives forever. I appreciate Dr. Hanks and uh, many times in her presentation and every week when I talk to her about reading, we're often talking about research-based and sometimes we uh, dismiss some of that, but she's really into effect size. What will work the best with this student? What will work the fastest with this group of students? What will help them access the curriculum in a better way? Um, so very, very important work very comprehensive work. Again, I had to thank the hundreds of teachers that are involved in this uh, and the rest of Dr. Hanks' staff. And Dr. 200 Hanks. more coming in August. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> so, I mean, again, I'm very passionate about this from the standpoint of how it affects the lives of children forever. And uh, we have a very comprehensive program. It's rare that uh, we're not talking about literacy every week, uh, even if it's Dr. Han Hanks asking for more resources. But uh, just frequently just asking, what is our next step? What else can we do? Uh, so I appreciate the presentation tonight, and the team will be glad to answer any questions. I know the, the time has gone by quickly. I just have one quick question. First of all, now you're making me rethink all those times in elementary school at Winter Street when we were reading aloud, if we were secretly being assessed. But, <laughs> Probably. Um, you, the high-low, can you go over that again? Because you said high interest, but then you said that is it high interest, but they're not interested in reading? I don't quite understand that. So the high interest means that there are book series. There are uh, high interest would be anything a child could be interested in. There's a book on that topic. So Got it, okay. There's books on basketball, football, soccer, fishing, um, trucks. You name the topic, they could be interested in these books. But they will actually be written at as low as a kindergarten level, but they look like chapter books. They look Got like it. high school books, so the kids don't mind carrying them around. They're carrying around a chapter book like everybody else is, or a novel, except the Lexile level is actually lower. So the, the first time um, we had a group of students, Western Heights shared with me, that got all excited. One of them took them home. She came back, she goes, I, I could read this book. Can I pick another? And so it's the first time they're actually, they realize that they can read. And once we hook them, now we can teach them. Got it. Wonderful. Thank you. Great presentation. I have a question, and I'm looking in my handout at the page that says uh, Comar 13A.06.09. 
with regard to the Maryland Early Literacy Initiative adoption. And what I think I heard you say was that we are, do, all systems are due to have this in place September of 2020, and we will be ready in August of 2019. I think I also heard you say, but not in every school. Previously. Previously. And so some of that is the universal screeners. We assess all children in every school. Teachers do that innately. That's how they design their instruction. We haven't had what's called a universal screener where we're all doing the same assessment. And that's what we'll have in every so, school. So by this school, this school year, year coming, we will have age. this yes. in place yes. in every school. Yes for every student. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. We're Thank prepared you. to be training all of our kindergarten <laughs> teachers in August when they come back. <laughs> well, I could hear good things happening. We had a policy committee meeting in the conference room, and I could hear what was happening out here, and it sounded very interesting and um, very lively. So. I apologize for the noise. No, no need, <laughs> no need. Any other questions? Thank you both. Dr. Henson, Dr. Henson. The only other thing I wanted to report is just, you know, professional development going on around the county, uh, a whole wide variety of topics. Uh, today, I had the opportunity to stop at Eastern, 145, 150 oh. uh, elementary teachers there working on elementary math and science, uh, working there all week with that large group. I stopped into, uh, I think, the last day of. Um, World language uh, workshop the team's been working for several days, several different weeks, and they're wrapped. They wrapped up today, and that workshop was excellent. It was they were at a secondary uh, science workshop today at Williamsport. I'm trying to get my schools right. Williamsport, uh, sorry, English language arts at Springfield, and they were doing, you know, into the work. People there from various grade levels, six, seven, eight, and a high school group that we're working to create resources to support other teachers and really looking at some of the collection uh, resources that we have and some of the rubric materials that we have there. Uh, and then we had a middle school and high school science group working today. Again, I'm seeing a lot of the same teachers put in a lot of work and effort in helping support themselves, uh, other fellow teachers, things they'll share in August. So very exciting work. I just want to thank all of our teachers. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Thank you. The next item of business is personnel action. Dr. Bishop. Good evening, Mrs. Williams, Dr. Michael, and board members. As discussed earlier in closed session this afternoon, there are several staff changes for your review. So at this time, I ask for your approval of today's personnel actions. Thank you. Is there a motion? To approve the personnel actions um, presented earlier today. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. There is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Any discussion, any questions? Okay, we'll move on to the vote. Approval of the personnel actions discussed earlier in closed session. All those in favor? Okay, we have six affirmative votes. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Williams, uh, Midas, I have on other occasions announced particularly principal moves um, or principal promotions. And we have one of those this evening for Marshall Street. Uh, Ms. Sarah Steer will be the principal of Marshall Street JDP program. Um, Sarah's an excellent candidate. We did have some uh, input from some parents and some concepts and ideas that they would like to see uh, in the new principal, and I'm, I'm confident that Sarah meets all of those expectations as well as the expectations of the central office and the Board of Education to serve those students. So very excited for Ms. Steer, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity for Marshall Street as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. We'll move on to reports to the board, and we'll have board member committee reports. Mr. Reidner, would you like to begin down there? Uh, we have not had a meeting since our last board meeting. Um, I will have to get together with Ms. Baker and make a determination as to when the next meeting is necessary. Thank you. Mr. Gesper, facilities? Yes, uh, facilities. Committee met this morning briefly to talk um, and review our projects. Um, best for the expansion project downtown Hagerstown, we are um, moving along fine on that. Uh, we were about a week behind, and I think we're, they said that they're just about ready to catch up. Uh, metal framing is going up, um, and it's taking place, and we are working to uh, get the roof um, 
get the building under route. Our Sharpsburg project is moving along also uh, very nicely. Um, and um, right now I think we're, we're moving some portables around. Uh, one is leaving Sharpsburg and moving to Salem and then we're moving two other ones to Salem. So um, those projects will be happening probably this week, next week. So that's uh, progress. And our next meeting will be August the 13th at 8 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bickford, Finance Committee. Finance Committee is scheduled to meet Tuesday, August 27th at 8 a.m. Mrs. Murray? Curry? Mm, excuse me. Curriculum and instruction met on Tuesday, May 28th. We had three hard about access and equity and advanced programs, Dr. Laura Hanks, um, electronic reading inventory, and um, Ms. Kate Long for document-based question online. And our next meeting will be Tuesday, September 24th at 4 p.m. in the board conference room. Thank you, Mrs. Laura. Mr. Matthews, do you have anything? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Fisher is not here to talk about policy review and development committee so we'll just move on from that under miscellaneous business future agenda items we have a list that you should have had in your packet um, coming up in August student service update advanced placement and in international baccalaureate data report in September, we'll be getting some uh, data reports regarding MCAP and uh, also SAT and ACT data. Also in September, we'll be having a report on discipline and suspensions. And uh, I think that's enough to take a look at. At this time, I'd like to remind my colleagues of. Uh, our meeting, our joint meeting with the commissioners coming up, uh, that would be August 6th, and we are meeting downtown with the commissioners, and then uh, we will be back here for our regular meetings, and on August 17th, we're having a board retreat here at CES, so I hope you have those things marked on your calendar. Uh, at this time, we'll move on to board member comments. Mr. Mackley, would you like to begin? I have nothing tonight. Thank you. Mrs. Murray? I have nothing tonight. Thank you. Nothing for me? Nothing. No. Nothing? We have a lot of staff that are still working during the summer, and I uh, want to thank them for their diligence, getting the buildings ready for the new school year, um, working outside in the heat. Um, we know how challenging that can be at this time, but uh, we want to thank them for their diligence to keep our school system running uh, smoothly. Thank you. Mr. Nothing at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Detro, I see that you're still sitting, and while I didn't want to get into um, what might appear to be an interrogation, asking you some questions, I would appreciate having a word with you at the close of the meeting, if, if you would be so inclined. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, anything else? No. Nope. Nope. Thanks. All right, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs>